to Puck Pacific, the show where we talk about all things Pacific Division hockey. I'm your host, Gio, and we are back after a couple of weeks. I had a little bit of a hiatus, but I've been watching a lot of hockey this week, and we have a lot to talk about of things that happened in the Pacific Division. So other than kind of the last episode where I spoke about specific teams in order, I actually just want to talk about these games for what they are, because there are four that I really, really want to discuss. The first one that I watched this week that I would really love to talk about is the Kraken versus the Ducks. Now, I was super interested in this one because I've been following both of these teams very, very closely this season so far. The Kraken, I have to say, have been really impressing me in general. The fact that they are second in the division right now, whereas this time last year they were in last place. I am so excited about that. But the Ducks also very interesting. You can watch my last video for my thoughts about the Ducks and where they're going in this season. Um, now, this game finished as a 5-4 to Seattle. Uh, so actually, it was quite good for the Ducks as far as things go, just considering some of the things that, um, you know, they haven't been having the best season so far. But I want to focus on Seattle first. Uh, like I said, I've been really enjoying them this season. I'm really enjoying this new first line uh, that's put Wenberg and Burakovsky up into the first line, previously the second line, and has kind of bumped the Beneers line down to second. Um, I think they've been doing really well. There have been a lot of good moments of synergization between particularly these two players that's allowed them to get some really crafty goals. Um, and I have to say as well, like, as for players that I'm really enjoying on Seattle, I want to give a shout out to Sprong as well. I think that he's been playing really tenaciously and has had some really impressive moments. For example, there was this goal in the third period where he kept on holding the puck due to the busyness in front of the net. He scored on the backhand at a sharp angle. It was a goal that I think you have to really have some grit to be able to continue and commit to, whereas a lot of people may have let go of that a little bit early. And so I think nice plays like that are just something that I've really been admiring about Sprong. Um, now, of course, I really have to give a shout out to Maddie Beneers. I've spoken about him a couple of times on this channel already, and I'm sure that's not going to slow down anytime soon. But he got three points in this game, um, and that put him at 18 points, which is decisively in the lead of all of the rookies for uh, points scored. Um, I think the next player down was Michelli at 13 after this game. And so I think he was kind of drawing with a couple of players last week and he's managed to pull away with that lead. But he has just been so impressive. I love watching the way he plays. I think that mechanically he's clearly very skilled. I like his attempts at rushes. I like the way he can be evasive around defenders of the opposing team. Um, and even though he's not necessarily representing the first line anymore, now that he's been bumped down to second, I still think that he just provides so much value and that gives him some space to grow uh, as well. Um, and I just love this player. I love this player. I love Matty Beneers. I I'm a Beneers stan, okay? I'm going to say it. <laughs> um, moving on to the Anaheim Ducks. This was a really interesting game for them because obviously the Anaheim Ducks have not been having the best season so far. Um, now, this was... <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't laugh. But this was a big game for the Anaheim Ducks and their progress in power plays. The Anaheim Ducks have notoriously had pretty terrible power plays uh, so far. To put it kind of diplomatically, I think that's fair. But um, they got their first power play goal in 10 power plays, um, which was scored by Troy Terry, uh, who actually is a player who I really want to give huge props to. He is one of the players who I've really pulled out from this whole squad as someone who I'm really enjoying watching. Obviously, kind of um, playing next to like people like Zegras and whatever. He's sharing a line with them. Like Maybe you get a little bit overshadowed shadow just because Zegris is the golden child and he gets spoken about so much but I think Troy Terry has just been he's been so what's the word I'm looking for he's like he's he's been so effective um this season so far he has amazing puck handling um he scored two points in this game I just love watching the way that he moves I love the fact that he's willing to push really hard like you see the way that he pushes up the boards, for example, to kind of move the puck and get it into the offensive zone. I think that he he's such a conduit for those kinds of plays, as well as making really impressive goals and assists at the same time. Um, for example, he had a pretty big role in uh, the goal that was scored by Henrik a little bit later on in the game um, by... He didn't even necessarily do anything direct for it, but the fact that he took so much attention off of 
the Kraken to allow Henrique to have some open space to be able to score a goal, have the puck pass to him and get that puck in the back of the net. Things like that are just really huge. And I think he's just such a massive player on this team. Um, but back to the power play goals. I'm just really impressed with this fact, okay? I just love the fact that they got they got some power play goals. It's really good to see them starting to do that. Yes, they're still left wanting on the defense and that is something that's not gonna be instantly fixed. Um, and I do feel bad for the Ducks in this regard. The fact that Drysdale's out with his injury, he's probably not gonna be back for the rest of the regular season, let's be real. So like their biggest development point on the defense is just like, guess we'll play without him so i do feel bad for them with that even though i can see that there is improvement necessary there but to, get, to see the improvement in their power plays has been really good um and i like that they seem to warm up a bit throughout the course of the game because they struggle to get the puck out of their own zone in the first period and then a little later on is when you kind of started to see them just feel a little bit more looseness i guess in the way that they were playing really enjoyed this game um, so let's move on to the second. So the second game I want to talk about is the Canucks versus the Sharks. And this finished 4-3 to Vancouver in overtime. Um, so this was an interesting game. Um, I've only seen a couple of the Sharks games so far this season. Uh, they've definitely been an interesting squad to watch. They are currently sat in dead last um in the standings for the pacific division despite having some really impressive moments and i think uh the fact that carlson has been spoken about as much as he has been like i you would have to be living under a rock to have missed those kinds of discussions about him as a player and how he's having this resurgence and is just doing so much for the team um i really like the fact that san jose took the initiative and took the opportunity to get a lot of early shots in when they had that puck possession early on in the game um because you know obviously getting as many shots on goal as possible is going to give you the highest opportunity or the highest chance of um actually getting goals uh but the fact that they really like utilized that time that they had to take those um i was really happy with um again like carlson i mentioned before but he's kind of the point that i've got written down here i've put carlson obviously impressive like yeah of course carlson obviously impressive um i think one thing that he did really well because obviously we talk about the fact that he's a really high point scorer he's got a you know a number of goals a number of assists so far this season but one thing i thought he did a really good job of doing in this game uh was denying the canucks the opportunities to get goals on rebounds um so that kind of if you are a team and you're taking a shot on the goal, you've got a guy right there to catch the rebound or a guy maybe to tip it in or something like that, and you're actually denying half of those opportunities to that team, uh, that's pretty effective and that's a pretty big deal. Um, and I think that the Canucks have proven that they have struggled a little bit more against teams that have had really strong defenses. So something like that is actually really effective on them. Um, and I guess a testament to the fact that the regulation time ended at 3-3. Um, as for Vancouver, oh my god, I have been loving the second line on this team. And I, okay, so I'm pretty sure they played last night. I should know this. I'm pretty sure they played last night. I saw some stuff on Twitter throughout the week saying that, uh, for example, in practice and whatever, they were actually switching the second and the first lines. But in this game, that had not yet happened. Um, and it had also hadn't happened in the game versus the uh, the Caps a little bit later on in the week, which we will also talk about. Um, so I'll still refer to them as the second line uh, at, at this point. Um, but I love that second line. Pedersen and Mikheyev. Mikheyev? Wow. <laughs> Pedersen and Mikheyev have played so well together. Um, and I don't want to leave Kuzmenko out of there. And Kuzmenko has obviously been a really, really good player so far this season. But I just, in this game particularly, the synergy between Pedersen and Mikheyev, oh my God, I have been enjoying so much. I feel like they set each other up so well. And in this game in particular, this line alone got six points three of which were goals and each of those goals were scored by a different individual um so there is just such a well-roundedness going on in this line and it makes me really excited for the development of these players and kind of the rest of the season with the canucks i think because i feel like they've really landed on something with this line um, just talking about the defense a little bit, because obviously that has been a point that the Canucks have needed to 
improve upon, and that's been noted by a number of pundits. Uh, I actually really want to give credit to Burrows um, in this game. I thought he really stood out getting some good blocks and interceptions in the game, and I think that seeing him be really involved is really good. Obviously, when talking about the defense when it comes to the Vancouver Canucks, you always default to Quinn Hughes, um, and so being able to pinpoint different things that other defensemen uh, are contributing to the team, I think is really, really good, and especially when it's perhaps a less talked about um, demon, especially. Um, now, I actually pulled some interesting stats uh, from this team about both of the teams. Um, and that is that the second and fourth lines of Vancouver all had a 50% a plus Corsi 4 percentage, um, as well as the entire first line defense and half of the second line defense in Hughes Bear and Oliver Ekman Larson. Now, interestingly, on the San Jose Sharks, the first and third lines of the San Jose Sharks all had a 50% plus Corsi 4 percentage, and they were also joined by by the first line defense and half of the second line defense in Megna Carlson and Benning. So I just thought that those were kind of some interesting parallels in the statistics. And I think it's also a testament to the effectiveness that you're actually getting out of those specific lines, like the second line that I mentioned. Um, and I've been really enjoying the fourth line in Vancouver, but I'm going to hold off on them for now because I have a little bit more to say about them when we get to the Canucks versus Caps game after this next one. So... The next game I want to talk about, <laughs> oh my god, is maybe the weirdest, craziest, weirdest <laughs> game that I have seen so far in the NHL, especially this season. And I could not stop watching this game with such awe. I felt like I would look down at my paper to write something and immediately something would happen and my jaw would just drop. And that is... The Seattle versus LA game, the, the Kings versus the Kraken, which finished 9-8 to Seattle in overtime. 9-8, 17 goals in total in this game. What is that? This is actually the game so far in the NHL that has had the most goals scored of any game that we've had so far this season. Um, my next line that I've written in my notes is, what the actual fuck was this game? And I think that sums it up pretty damn well. We had six goals taken in the first period, four, four of which were power play goals, two on each team. It's like, the first goal was like 16 seconds in. And look, that happens here and there. You get games where the first goal is really, really early. And I remember like that first goal getting scored 16 seconds in and I'm just there like, whoa, that was pretty cool. Uh, and then it just doesn't stop. It just didn't stop. It never ended. Um, <laughs> it's actually nuts. Um, I have to say as for players that I was particularly like kind of looking out for in this game and, and enjoying, I really enjoying the way that both Eberly and Borgen play on the side of Seattle. Um, I think both of them are, are not afraid to get involved in engagements. So whether they're really trying to check hard on the forecheck, on the back check, um, really trying to apply pressure onto the other team, assuming that they have puck possession, maybe trying to get the puck really far down the ice, um, whatever it may be, I think both of them are not they're not like passive in the way that they play uh, when they need to be. So I, I think that's really good. And I've been really enjoying watching that from both of them. That said, I think the forechecking on both sides was actually fairly decent. And it, it was kind of the reason that we had a number of the goals that we did have, you know, because what would kind of happen is a forecheck would occur that maybe the team that was previously in possession of the puck wasn't kind of expecting and then that would lead them to be unprepared and unready for a goal to be taken or a shot to be taken on the goal and therefore the goal is more open than it otherwise would be if they already had possession of the puck now you can still put that down to like the diligence of the team being at fault um because look if a team is trying to forecheck and and you're not ready that's still on you like you can't just assume that the forecheck is going to be unsuccessful. Um, but there were a number of successful forechecks in this game. So I guess that has to be credit as well as 
not credit <laughs> given to both sides because of um, the cause and effect in those situations. Um, I think there were a couple of other examples of, of maybe some lack of vigilance occurring at times. And look, I just want to preface this and say, I get it. This game looked exhausting. Like it was such a fast paced game that I can understand that that's maybe the case. But for example, there was a point in the second period where um, a pass was trying to be made across the ice between two Kings players and they weren't really tracking Bjorkstrand who just comes straight in, steals the puck. Um, and okay, great. Like, cool. Uh, <laughs> um, I think this game overall was really whack. I don't know how else to put it. This game was ridiculous um, and definitely the most entertaining of the season so far. So this puts us on to game number four, which was the Caps versus the Canucks. I just watched this one last night and this was a bit more of a tragedy for the Canucks as this finished 5-1 to Washington. And I feel like watching this game was exhausting as a fan. Like I could feel the just erosion <laughs> happening to the vancouver um canucks there was this real i want to say war of attrition but i don't want to call it a war because that implies that both sides were on fairly equal like it wasn't it was like a wall and vancouver were trying to walk into it it was more like an infinite square well potential for those of you who know physics um it was really cool seeing ovi get on on his second goal of the game he got his uh he got the record for the most goals scored by a single player on the road beating out Wayne Gretzky. So that's kind of nice. You always like to see like a cool little record be um, broken, I guess. Um, but obviously the Caps are not part of the Pacific Division. So I'm not going to focus on those as much. As for the Canucks, there were, I mean, I don't know, man. Like there were times where it felt like they were maybe a little bit pressured and unable to make passes where they normally would have been able to there were a couple of blunders there um i think that by the second period it was really clear that vancouver wanted to bully washington they could see how coordinated their setups were how coordinated their passing and, and, and i almost said coordination was then um and also their defense, like their defense was very strong. So what do Vancouver do? Let's throw on the fourth line and try and wear them down as much as we can. And you know what? I admire the strategy. It's just unfortunate that it didn't work as well as it, they would like to. I always love watching players like Orman and Lazar really go at it because both of them are very good at being very physical you'd hope from a fourth liner um in the game but it just wasn't really enough and actually it's interesting because you know when i got to the end of the game i was like actually i want to see like what the time on ice for those players was compared to the last five games let's say um and there was a significant difference for lazar he had 14 minutes 50 time on ice for this game compared to the last five games where his maximum was 1306 and his minimum was 1003 as for orman he had 1531 on the ice for this game compared to his last five games where his max was 1444 and his minimum was 1137 and then for for Joshua, it was 1344 in this game compared to his last five games where his maximum was 1143 and uh, his minimum was 952. So those are like some kind of, I would say not insignificant differences. I think especially when you look for someone like um, Joshua or Lazan, it's a little bit not as big a jump for Orman, but it's definitely tells that tale that Vancouver were trying to utilize their fourth line a little bit more because there was just... There was no crack to really like break into with Washington. So they were kind of trying to wear them down a little bit. It's just a shame it wasn't really enough. Um, I mean, I have to give credit to uh, Kemper for just the way that he goaltended. I thought he had a really, really good game um, in this uh, game. You know, we saw some really good attempts be made by Vancouver. For example, Elias Pettersson trying with his wraparound, or he didn't try with a wraparound, he tried with a fake wraparound to sort of bring the puck back round. But Kemper, rather than reacting, like if you're a goaltender and you're expecting a wraparound, you're going to go to the other side of the goal. He actually didn't do that. He still kind of lingered on the short side of the net, uh, which meant that um, Pettersson wasn't uh, able to get away with that. And I thought that that was very smart play from Kemper I thought that was really well reading of the situation um 
But ultimately, it just wasn't enough for Vancouver. They actually finished this game with more shot, quite a decent number, more shots on goal than Washington, which looks bad as a differential. But I'm also not mad about it because I think that taking shots on goal is something that obviously should be encouraged. And so to see Vancouver having at least tried to set those situations up and take those shots is really good. Like, that's a really good thing. And that's something that they can build on going forward. That's where I'm going with that one. So those are some of the games that I watched this week that I really wanted to talk about on Pacific this week. I know some games happened last night that I need to catch up on, but that's one of the problems with time zones. So just leave that as it is. Um, I really hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Let me know what you thought about any of the games that I mentioned or the teams that I mentioned this week, because I am really interested. I mean, you can kind of see a trend. I am so fascinated by the freaking Seattle Kraken right now. Um, but that Kings game that they played was like, what is this? And I don't know. I, I really love that at least in the games that I have watched, I've been able to pick out different players every time. And that gives me faith in a lot of these teams um, for them going forward um and i've just been really enjoying it so far so let me know what you think and i'll see you in the next episode goodbye